Hey everyone, this video is actually part of a series that I teach at institutions for MCAT skills like research design and critical reasoning. The format is a little different than our usual YouTube videos, but I found it to be very valuable for students, so I hope you enjoy. In this video, we're going to cover all of the variable terms that can come up in research design and in science-based passages. Here are the six major terms that can come up, and I'll tell you that the first four are much more common than the last two. So we're going to start there and work our way through the definitions. Our first variable is the independent variable, and this is what the researchers manipulate in order to see what happens. So for example, if we wanted to study the effect of having music playing on test takers, we would independently manipulate whether the music was present or absent in the testing environment. That makes the music or the presence or absence of music the independent variable because it's something that we the researchers are controlling for and changing. Other common independent variables are things like age, where we'll group people by age and then see how they'll behave in a certain way. Dependent variables are the thing that we're measuring. So if we wanted to measure, again, back to our music and test performance study, if we want to measure students' performance with or without music, the dependent variable would be the thing that we're measuring, that we're curious about, which would be the student's performance. So how students perform on that exam would be the dependent variable. All right, so the independent variable is like, ooh, if we change this, what happens? And the dependent variable is the what happens, the measurement that comes out of the research study. Now, we can have multiple independent variables in a given study. In our music example, we could have music being present or absence, and we could study whether it makes a difference whether we're using math tests or vocabulary tests. So the type of test and the music are both independent variables. However, for a good research study, we should only be measuring one thing at a time. So in this case, that would be the performance on the given exam. So we only want to have one dependent variable per research study, but we can have multiple independent variables working in concert in the setup. Our next type of variable is a control variable, which is really our baseline that we're comparing our data to. It's really important to have a baseline so we know, did our dependent variable increase, decrease in a measurable way compared to, again, that baseline. There are two types of controls, and we'll usually use one or the other depending on the type of study. So let's say that I wanted to study the effect of caffeine on students' testing performance. A negative control would be a placebo, where I give a bunch of students in the study a real dose of coffee, and then I give another group a decaffeinated coffee, and I don't tell them who is who. That is a negative control because we expect zero effect of caffeine to happen in the placebo group. So negative control is where we expect no impact of the independent variable to be present in the results for that negative control. A positive control is where we do expect some impact to happen. So just to keep the example clear, in our example of caffeine and students, maybe I did that experiment with coffee, a positive control would be me using an energy drink or some other caffeinated beverage that is similar to coffee but still manifestly different in terms of how it tastes and how it feels. However, it still has the same amount of caffeine, so it should have the same results. We should see an, a change if there was a change for coffee as well. So a positive control is where we definitely should see results and we can compare that to our experimental value. A negative control is we expect to not see results and we compare that to our experimental value. Now we're on to the types of variables that can impact the results of the study and essentially impact the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable that we're expecting to see. Confounding variables are, are bad things. They're things that are external influences that impact both the independent and the dependent variable in a way that's independent from the actual relationship that we're studying in our hypothesis. So for example, if I was to be studying the effects of caffeine on student performance, one of the confounding variables could be sleep. Because if we have different levels of sleep, that can impact the effect caffeine can have on us and, of course, can affect our cognitive performance on an exam. So if somebody in this study got a really bad night of sleep versus someone who got a really good night of sleep, that can impact the results of the study in a way that's separate from the relationship of caffeine to academic and testing performance. 
So confounding variables, again, external influences that impact both the independent and the dependent variable in a separate way. Often in human research studies, these can include demographics like age, gender, socioeconomic status, and physical location. Next up are two rarer types of variables, but I want to put them on your list just so you have them. A moderating variable is something that doesn't completely change the relationship, but may change the strength or even the direction of the relationship if it's present. So for example, in our caffeine versus academic performance situation, let's say that we did that study and we found that caffeine did help with academic performance, but it was especially true for graduate students. So maybe there was a directionality where, yep, more caffeine definitely helped um, performance, but it helped more if you were in a graduate program than an undergraduate program. So the moderating variables like the level of education or even age, right, where the older you are, the higher level of education, the more benefit you get from caffeine when taking exams. And those are usually good opportunities for future research studies to explore that relationship further. So while moderating variables influence the strength and or the direction of the relationship between independent and dependent variable, the mediating variable explains the relationship. So we're not changing it, we're explaining it. I like to think of the mediating variable as the link between the independent and the dependent variable. That's like, aha, here's why the relationship works the way it does. So in, again, in our caffeine versus performance example, what do you think could be the why of why caffeine improves performance on the exam? Is it the act of drinking? Is it the hydration levels? Maybe it's the alertness that you get from caffeine. The more alert somebody is, the better they perform on the exam. That could explain, since caffeine increases alertness and alertness improves performance, why we would see a positive correlation, right? An increase in caffeine equals an increase in performance in this example. So mediating, again, it doesn't change the relationship at all. What it's doing is it's explaining, it's bridging the two variables and explaining why that phenomenon might happen. And that's another really useful future area of study because maybe you don't want to drink caffeine, but you do need to be alert to perform well on exam day. So maybe finding other resources to increase alertness would be a good follow-up study. And here we have all the definitions of the major types of variables you'll see in research design that we'll need to use for critical reasoning in science-based passages and sections of standardized tests. Feel free to take a screenshot of this screen so you have all of the information handy. Okay, and that was my lesson on research design variables. I hope you found it helpful, and if you'd like more videos in this format on basic MCAT skills, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for joining me, and as always, happy studying.